next year will be the 25th anniversary of the invention of laser powder by diffusion for metals and the invention of metal 3D printing with this. So as we look back 24 years, we can ask the question, what has been accomplished? <laughs> so if you look at the use of additive manufacturing in space, companies like SpaceX and other innovators, startups, have completely revolutionized the rocket engines and the space flight using additive manufacturing. Many of these companies talk publicly about their use of additive manufacturing and how it can allow them to get much improved systems, better engines, higher thrust, and higher payload on the rockets, as well as much faster development time and lower cost. So when we look at the contribution of additive manufacturing to space, we can really be proud about how additive manufacturing is powering the new space race. However, if you look at other industries, 25 years of work, billions of dollars of investment, when we look at the utilization of additive manufacturing for real production in oil and gas, aviation, and power generation, the results are extremely disappointing, in particular in the context of the investment and the amount of time that was spent on that. So the question is why the contribution of additive manufacturing in these very large industries is so negligible. So let's take a look at laser powder bed fusion. Laser powder bed fusion is truly a remarkable process. I would call it a genius process. It's extremely simple. You lay out a layer of powder, you lay with the, uh, a laser and melt the powder, and the powder solidifies almost instantaneously within a millisecond, and you repeat that layer after layer to make the full part. Truly simple, truly genius. However, the simplicity of additive manufacturing and laser powder bed fusion is misleading and is really deceptive. At the heart of that, it's actually a super complicated process. If you look at what has to be accomplished to maintain quality parts, one needs to control the laser beam to be very precise, very accurate, both in terms of position, in terms of spot size, in terms of the power and the uniformity of that. The gas flow is already known to be a super critical component of the process and has to be very consistent over time and very uniform. The powder bed has to be consistent and uniform, and <clears throat> both in terms of composition, density, and uh, morphology. And then we have to uh, watch contamination, water, oxygen, and other species. And the material properties can vary if any of those uh, shifts from uh, nominal uh, uh, values. The most depressing thing, however, is that even if we do all this thing right, the geometry of the part varies. We are not building one cube of consistent material. We are building complex geometries. And the thing is that if you apply the same process everywhere, outcomes will vary because the geometry affects the outcome. There are local effects of the geometry that actually interact with the process. So when you look at this, it's actually a pretty depressing picture in terms of complexity. How can you get accurate and consistent outcomes with such a complicated process? The good news, we have seen this in the past. And where we have seen that? We have seen that in semiconductors. So let's think for a second about semiconductors. If you look, talk about, if you look at a processor, a typical processor will have about 100 steps, 100 layers of production that can take between three and five months from beginning to end. And it will have billions of devices that all have to work perfectly in order for the chip to work. So if you think about that, hundreds of steps, billions of devices, a few months of processing from beginning to end, how do we even have a chance to make a single chip work, not to mention make chips at 95% yield? How do they do that? The answer is local quality control. So when you look at semiconductor, and I spent a good few years in semiconductor, the way we used to control quality in semiconductor is at every step of the process, you monitor the process between 10 to 20 to 30 
different metrology tools and different metrology techniques that validate in every stage of the process that the process is completely controlled and there is no single excursion in one of multiple variables that can cause the chips that are made in this lot to be defective. As you are measuring that, you are centering the process so that it's always at the center, at the sweet spot of its process window. So you are making as high yield parts as possible, high, as high consistent parts as possible. You are using the final test only as a learning mechanism to optimize this local tweaking and this local control of the process. But the process is controlled always locally, not globally. If you look at this in contrast, and you think of how do we control quality today in additive manufacturing, we really do quality control the, the way you used to do quality control in the casting age. You take 10 cell bars, you pull on them, and you hope that if the results of the tensile bar are consistent, the parts that you are making are consistent. But if you think about this with the complexity of the process, this is not going to cut it. And the results actually show that. <laughs> the good news is that it doesn't have to be that bad. Additive manufacturing at its heart is a digital process. As a digital process, we can measure anything that we like, and we can change anything that we like. We, if we apply the right metrology and the right sensors, we can monitor as we go everything that can cause the process to deviate and to fail, and we can make sure that the process is always at the center of its process window, it's always at its sweetest spot, and it's always as stable as possible. This is not a trivial task. I'm not claiming for a second it's a trivial task. But we have been shown the way in semiconductor, and we can take the methodology that was applied in semiconductor and apply that in additive manufacturing. This is not a theoretical exercise. We have a product that is doing exactly that, and it is being tested right now by better customers. So. <clears throat> Quality is a big challenge, and in the absence of high quality control, it will be very difficult to use additive manufacturing as a real production technology for mission critical applications like aviation, oil and gas, and power generation. So now that we have an understanding of what the methodology that we need to apply to use additive manufacturing in production and tight quality control, we can ask the question, how do we go from here? How do we actually apply that? So we have products that are coming. Velo3D has one. There are other people that are developing such products. How do we apply those products and perfect them? Because one thing is clear. These products are not going to be good and not going to be totally perfect from day one. As we are going to build parts and as we are going to manufacture, we are going to learn about failure modes and we are going to continue to be surprised and we are going to tighten the quality control and tighten the manufacturing quality to be better and better. So how do we do this? How do we actually deploy this technology to make quality parts? There is no shortcut for that. What I mean by there is no shortcuts, the only way to get this manufacturing technology to be production ready and to be quality that is desired for these mission critical uh, applications is to actually do production and to actually get it better and better. So what will be the parts that we can start with low risk and with minimum investment in exercise the technology in production setting and perfect that? So the ultimate parts for those are direct parts replacement. And what I mean by direct part replacement are parts that are already in circulation and are already in production by other methods. These are parts that were designed to be cast welded, machined and welded, machine and brazed, you name it. But they are already in production. Many of these parts have multiple manufacturing issues, multiple supply chain issues. Many of them have low volumes, and they are ideal candidates for additive manufacturing. If you could do direct part replacements for parts like that, this is a fantastic opportunity because you could do this very fast, the demand for these parts already exist. These parts are in consumption, in circulation. So you could start consumption of these additively manufacturing parts really quickly if you could make them. 
you would have very high ROI because it's the minimal effort. You don't need to redesign these parts. The parts already exist. You could move to consumption really quickly. So low effort and low uh, time combined to high ROI. But the most important thing is if we start with parts that already exist and they are already in consumption, this forces us to stop playing with design and to stop playing with materials development and stop playing with million other things, but focus us on the elephant in the room, which is the sore, the sore state of quality. So focus on the quality and focus on the manufacturing quality control and make sure that we perfect that. So the beautiful thing about direct part replacement is that it focuses us to put our attention on the most painful problem of additive manufacturing that is needed to be solved to develop it as a manufacturing technology. Well, there is another side to this story. And the other side to this story is that <coughs> additive manufacturing is not an all-capable technology. There are limitations to what additive manufacturing can do. And the limitations, in particular, I'm talking in laser powder bed for fusion for metals, is that any time that you are building overhangs with less than 45 degree incline, you will have to support them. And if you have supports that are internal to the parts or are touching critical surfaces that are hard to access, it will be hard to remove the supports and it will be even harder to get the surface after you remove the supports to be of serviceable quality or of usable quality. So parts like that are generally not manufacturing friendly for additive manufacturing and not manufacturable. So the result is that there are a lot of parts that are non-manufacturable by additive manufacturing. And the saddest thing about that is that these parts that are non-manufacturable are actually the parts that you would like to do direct part replacement with. Because parts that are easy to machine and that all the external surfaces are easy to get to are parts that are also uh, not do not need additive manufacturing. So the parts that you would like to additive manufacture are the parts that have complicated internal features that are not friendly to manufacture in other ways. So because of the presence of supports, current additive manufacturing cannot really do part replacement. So what I show in these pictures are parts that have very complicated supports, internal supports that are hard to access and hard to uh, remove and clean the surface after them. So welcome to the world of support-free capability. So we introduced the ability to print parts without support in laser powder bed fusion. So the same fundamental technology, but a new capability. <coughs> By doing so, we can open the ability to make parts that were previously impossible to make. What I'm showing on the right is a diffuser for a power generator by a company called KW Micropower. KW Micropower is a startup from Florida that is developing very high power and very small gas generator. At its heart, it has uh, this part that is the diffuser for the gas turbine. And it has a very, very complicated internal structure that requires surfaces down to zero degree with very good surface finish uh, internal to the parts. We were able to help KW Micropower to make these parts after they were working for about a year with many other suppliers and failed to make these parts. This is about 300 millimeter titanium part, very massive part. And uh, uh, they were able to assemble their engine and to test it and continue in the development of their product. They will be ramping production in about a year. So now that we enabled making parts that are not designed for additive manufacturing, we can start seriously doing direct part replacements, both for manufacturing and as well as spare parts. What you can see here is a gear also about 300 millimeter in diameter. This is a gear that is 100 year old on the left. The supplier of this gear, as you can know, you can imagine, is already not in business for a long time. This part was scanned and reproduced without any design change and it has a lot of internal features that are not uh, friendly for additive manufacturing. There are many more parts like that that we are making and we can make. So what you can see here is the Velo3D product suite. This is an end-to-end -end manufacturing solution. The Flow print preparation software is a CAM software that 
allows that prescribes the manufacturing process that over overcomes all the failure modes, preventing the construction of low overhangs and other features that are impossible to print with additive manufacturing. Sephir is our printer, is the, the printing system, and it executes the manufacturing process prescribed by Flow. Sephir also includes a number of unique metrology capabilities and unique metrology sensors that are collecting data about the process and are used to control the process. This data is then analyzed by our quality assurance and control software that is providing a very simple data at the end. It doesn't provide a terabyte of data per build, which it provides as well, but that's not the smart thing about this. It actually provides for each of the parts that is made a very simple answer. Is this a good part or not? Was this part made within control limit or not? And it looks at few hundreds attributes to get to this conclusion, and it reports on all these few hundreds attributes. So if you are a manufacturer and you're manufacturing for an end customer, parts that need to be within quality control, it provides a full traceability control report on the produced parts. This software is right now in beta testing in few customer, with few customers and will be released in a few weeks, so please stay tuned. <clears throat> the capability to make direct part replacements without redesign and to quality control the process allows us to unleash production in aviation, oil and gas, and power generation, and to allow companies in these fields to start utilizing additive manufacturing as a serial production technology now and gain the confidence in this technology as a manufacturing technology as a critical stepping stone that would enable them in the second phase to start taking bold design choices that would allow them to make disruptive and transformative products similarly to what we have seen in space. So in the next, we have a good number of customers that are now in validation phases of transform, uh, transitioning parts that are uh, legacy parts to additive manufacturing. And we are going to see over the next years the, over the next two years, an avalanche of companies in aviation, oil and gas, and power generation that are moving to serial production with additive manufacturing of legacy parts that were produced in other technologies. So, welcome to the future. The future is here. Thank you.